Software's Thursday webinars. My name is David Sanford and I am the Regional Sales Director for Carlson Software in the South Central part of the United States. The subject of today's webinar is working with DEM files inside of Carlson Software. And uh, this week I uh, once again have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Paul Carlson. Paul will be presenting today's webinar on DEM files. Paul is the president and founder of Carlson Desktop Solutions. Uh, they have been one of our, our premier top resellers since Paul formed the company back in 2007. Paul has over 15 years of experience with AutoCAD or CAD-based related software. He is a member of our Carlson College and he has 10 years of experience as a trainer. Today, Paul is going to answer for us, what, what is a DEM file? DEM is a digital elevation model. Paul is going to show us how to work with DEM files, where to obtain DEM files, and how to handle DEM files inside of Carlson software. He's also going to show us how to create a surface using DEM files, how to draw contours, and he'll create a, some profile data for us. If you have any questions for us, I invite you to, to type those in on the question bar. Uh, if you have any questions afterwards, please do not hesitate to call me or Paul. Paul can be reached at 512-335-4018 or at info at carlsonds.com. And you see my information there as well. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Paul now, and Paul's going to take it away and show us working with DEM files in Carlson Software. Take it away, Paul. Thanks, Dave. Uh, as we still have a few people coming in, I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, point out a couple of resources that, that we make available to, uh, uh, to our clients as well as uh, users of Carlson Software. Uh, the very first is our website, carlsonds.com. The uh, main feature to point out, or probably the biggest two, number one being the knowledge base uh, full of different documents uh, that we put up over the last couple of years. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a login option to log into secure content, which would be videos and things we posted for clients. The other thing that you can get to uh, from the website would be our blog page. And I bring this up for a, uh, for a, a very good reason. The last topic that we did on the blog was about NED files. And the NED, uh, the National Elevation Data Set, is a, a little bit newer format than what we've been seeing on the DEMs. And it's something we'll talk about as we get into the presentation. But there's a little video on how to uh, uh, work with uh, the NED files, for example. We also make available to our clients our uh, Facebook page, as well as our monthly newsletter, which dates back all the way to May of 2008. So we've been doing these for a while. It's a one, once a month publication. has different tips and tricks and random things that people have called in and asked over uh, the prior 30 days. The USGS website we're going to come back to after we get into the presentation here, uh, because that's going to answer the question of, where do we obtain or where do we get these, uh, these DEM files? So let's start by answering the question, what is a DEM file? Okay. Now there are two things to, uh, to, to look at here, two different types of uh, DEM data. And the one I'm going to focus on will be the DEM files, the digital elevation models provided by the U.S. Geologic Survey. One of the things I think that's happened over the last few years, similar to what we've seen in general surface model terminology, is a confusion of terms uh, or a, a confusion of file types because it, it's been a little cloudy. With surface models, for example, you hear the term DTM used. Uh, DTM should be a generic term used to describe, to describe a digital terrain model. Uh, some software companies have adopted that as their extension for their surface models. Uh, just as Carlson, for example, uses TIN for their 
uh, surface models or they're triangulated irregular networks. All of these things have kind of uh, gotten clouded or, or, or muddied up here, and it makes it a little difficult to figure out. But a, a DEM, in the basic sense, is, is a digital elevation model. It's a surface model uh, of, of, of data. And what I want to focus on is the USGS DEM. The USGS, uh, USGS DEM standard uh, is a geospatial file format developed by the USGS. Uh, there are similar elevation data sets out there, uh, but not, uh, not quite the same as what we're looking at today. And those other formats do include the NED, which is also provided by uh, the USGS, and that refers back as well to the document that's on the, uh, the blog about the NED files. The types of DEM data available from USGS, the USGS basically produces five primary types of elevation data. Uh, the very first would be the seven and a half minute DEMs. These are 30 by 30 minute grid squares. Basically, you're looking at the uh, uh, coverage of a seven and a half minute quadrangle. Okay, coverage goes for the contiguous United States. There's also coverage for Hawaii and Puerto Rico. And as you'll see in the uh, uh, the next slides, there's also specific coverage for the state of Alaska. 30 minute DEMs. DEMs are two by two arc second data spaces. One degree DEM, one degree blocks are three arc by three arc seconds. And now we get into the last two, which are the seven and a half minute Alaska DEM and the 15 minute Alaska DEM. Okay. There is a ton of documentation and information on the web. If you go to usgs.org, uh, uh, there are other places you can go to find this information uh, if you want specifics. The USGS standards are published in PDF format, so there's all kinds of information out there. This is just a general brief. You know, this is essentially what we're looking at. Okay, so th there are four. The, the basic types of DEM data, where does all this come from? Where does the USGS get this information? And the USGS uses four main methods to collect the DEM data. Interpolation from the DLG, a GESALT photo mapper method, manual profiling from photogrammetric stereo models. So this is what we've used for, for decades to create uh, GIS maps and other things. We, we fly an area, we use stereo plotters, we plot the data. That's the other source. And then interpolation of the elevations from those stereo model digitized contours. So those are the four main methods that the USGS used to collect the data. Uh, and you can kind of see there's a, a discrepancy in the methods as far as the accuracy you're going to get. Um, and, and that's addressed, again, if you go in and look at the standards for uh, the, the USGS, there are specific standards on how the data is processed and uh, what level DTM you're getting. Now, the accuracy depends on the source and resolution. That's pretty, uh, pretty easy to, to understand. The, the difference in accuracy between a uh, single GPS receiver post-processed uh, or not even post-process data compared to an RTK using multiple baseline solutions. Huge difference in how the data is collected, so there's huge difference in the accuracy. Same thing here. Okay? The way the data is collected or processed dictates kind of the, uh, the accuracy on it. So when we're talking about the accuracy, we know it's not perfect. It's not as good as me going out as a surveyor and surveying this. Why would I even bother? What can I do with this DEM data? Why would I want to use it? Well, I wouldn't want to send a survey crew out to survey you know, 200 acres worth of data or 2,000 acres worth of data just to do a, a, a water flow analysis, for example. That's where I start using my DEM files. Instead of taking the USGS quad and uh, digitizing data or manually calculating off the paper, I can actually do this in my computer. If we look at programs like Carlson, uh, the, the sewer programs and the, and the watershed modeling, I can actually take advantage of this data inside those programs and use it to get digital analysis instead of uh, all manual. 
uh, creation of relief maps, 3D renderings. There are all kinds of, of scenarios where the data from the DEM could be applied, uh, and we're typically talking about large scale. I don't know that I would go get a DEM to get a you know, contour map for the Walmart I'm building down the street, but if I wanted to do an overall site analysis in three dimensions, rather than going out and surveying this, the DEM file may be a good supplement to my survey data. Okay, it may be uh, something good to add into what we're doing. Okay, so show me the money. How do we do it? What do we do with a DEM file? How do we get it in and how do we make it happen? Well, what I want to do first is I want to go back to the USGS website. Okay, USGS.gov. Once you get into USGS.gov, you can browse around, you can look, uh, and, and get to the point of the DEM files, the digital elevation models. And under the DEM dropdown, there's an alphabetical list of the 1 to 250,000 scale DEMs. So if I wanted to take uh, the Austin, for example, I could download that file save it to my computer and begin using it. The .gz extension is simply a zip extension. Okay, it's, a, it's another format of, of zip. So I would download it, unzip the file, and then begin process, processing it inside my software of choice. Okay. In my case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this into Carlson. Okay. Now, since we're talking about gridded data, it kind of makes sense that I would handle this as a grid inside of Carlson. So that's actually where I'm going to go. Inside of Carlson Civil, I'm going to go to the surface menu. I'm going to modify a grid file. And what I'm interested in are the grid file utilities. Holy cow, that's a lot of options. Options are a good thing. I can do a lot of things with this DEM once I have it in. Now normally I would start uh, from the top of the box and work my way uh, down through, but I'm actually going to skip ahead to start with importing my grid file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the button to import a grid, and I have all kinds of information or different formats I can bring in, including my DEM file. So I'm going to import the DEM file. In my project folder where I had downloaded and saved this file, I'm going to grab the Austin West DEM file. And then I'll bring it in. Now one of the things I want to point out here, if you're familiar with using Carlson, uh, in the open boxes on a lot of commands, not all of them have this, but a lot of them do, uh, to the right, they show me a list of all the files that are in my folder. They show me any files I've recently used, and above that, if applicable, a preview. Okay. So here I'm seeing a preview of the DEM file. Now the DEM file, and one of the things that makes it nice is that it is a self-contained file. So we're not talking about for this one uh, elevation model here. I don't have. 15 files I have to unzip and extract and merge in. This is a self-contained ASCII file. Okay. From the USGS website, you can read about the format, uh, how it's coded out, what the different columns and everything mean that you see uh, here. Every one of these has an exact purpose. If you open this file that you download from USGS and you don't see some sort of preview, this is telling me that it is a readable preview. It is an ASCII preview of the file. I would question what's happening because according to USGS, there is no known binary analog format of this DEM file. Okay, so that is a, my first indication that maybe what I have isn't quite what I need. So I'll take my Austin DEM file, go ahead and open it. And the very first thing that we see is the information about our DEM file. So we see the grid spacing. We see the projection. 
So this one, for example, is State Plain 27. Because I'm dealing with Austin, I know that's Texas Central. Uh, oftentimes, you will actually see the full projection in here. Uh, I have another file I'll open. Uh, well, I'll just cancel this one, and I'll, I'll go ahead and open that one just to show you. If I import the grid, import DEM, I'll grab a different file just to show another format of what's here. So now I see this is NAT83, Texas South. So it gives me the full description of the projection being used. That one's quite a bit larger file, so I'm not going to use that one. I am going to stick with my original file, which was the Austin DEM, uh, just for the sake of keeping the file reasonable while working over the web. Okay. So I'm going to set my projection to state plane 27. Again, this is Texas. South Central, or Central, Texas Central, and then my units. Again, it tells me all of this information. My units are here. It's in meters. If I knew more information about the file, I could skip certain header rows. More commonly done with ASCII files, oftentimes you'll get a, a file import that has the headers listed at the top uh, and then the data down below that. With these DEM files, I should need to skip nothing. I should be able to bring it in exactly as it is. Okay, And I'll say OK. And now it's importing that file. So what essentially has just happened is I've converted that DEM model that we downloaded from USGS into a Carlson grid file. Now I have all the benefits of any of a, of a grid file inside of Carlson. So anything that I would do with a typical GRD file or grid file, I could do. Now, because we're working with such a massive amount of data when dealing with a DEM file, some of these commands over here may start to come in handy. Okay, I have the ability, for example, to add grid. And this is essentially saying, hey, I want to add one grid to another grid. Okay, I, I essentially want to do a, a merge here. I want to subtract grids. I want to subtract one grid from another grid. I want to change the units. Where's my change units? There we go, down at the bottom. I want to change the units. Maybe the DEM file we downloaded was in meters. I don't want it in meters because nothing else I'm going to do is in meters. I have the, the ability now to convert that from meters to feet. Okay. So change units is one that could come in handy. The other one similar or, or kind of along that same line would be change position. Maybe we brought this thing in. Uh, uh, on the state plane coordinates, and I need to move it to a assume northern easting, a 5,000, 5,000. Okay, I want to change the position. Probably the more common command in here is the change resolution. I need to decrease the amount of data that's in this file. Instead of a 1,000 by 1,000 grid square, I need to bring this thing down to a 3,000 by 3,000 foot square. I need to reduce the amount of data that's there. I can plot the grid. So I can draw this on the screen. This is basically the uh, draw 3D surface or draw 3D grid file. And then I can export my grid file. So if I wanted to take this into a different format, uh, I could export it into a CRT to an ASCII file, to a DTM file, or to a Carlson TIN file. I can merge grid files. So maybe I've downloaded two or three of these things. I can merge multiple files together. Okay. I can get information. I can get a list of my grid. So I'll go ahead and do a list. And then there is a listing 
of the northing, easting, and elevation of each grid corner within this GRD file. Okay. Just like all reports, I can save this, I can print it, I can draw it as text on the screen, whatever I need to, to do with it. I'm going to exit it and go back into the grid file utilities there. Along the lines of the uh, grid list, I can also get the uh, grid information. So here's the lower left corner, the upper right corner, the grid resolution. The grid size is 77 meters by 94 meters. The average standard deviations, minimum elevation value, maximum average slope. Good information for my grid file that, again, can be saved to a text file, printed, or drawn as text on the screen. If you are going to be manipulating multiple grid files or multiple DEM files, you can build a macro to the right of commands that you want to perform in succession. So I could say import, now do this uh, uh, change resolution, and then do this function, and, and so on. There's documentation in the help file for Carlson software that walks you through uh, what all of those macro options you have are and, and how you can use that. But essentially, it would be doing uh, multiple commands to that grid file at, at one time. Okay. So those are the, the, the commands that are there. What I want to do is I want to change the resolution of my file. Okay. And I'm going to go by dimensions of the cell. Our cell, uh, let's see what 100 by 100 looks like. So we get 900 cells in the X, 1,000 cells in the Y, 1,000 meter by 1,000 meter. That should be fine. We'll go ahead and reduce the resolution. I'll save that grid file. The file name used is the same name as the file I imported. And what I want to do now is I want to tell it to plot this on the screen. The draw 3D grid file option comes up. If I've used this command at any time in the last couple of years, this is going to look the same. Do I want to apply a vertical exaggeration to this? Do I want this drawn as 3D faces, preview only, a polyface mesh, or text? What layer should this go on? How the view should be oriented? Do I want to color by elevation? And if so, do I want to subdivide by color? I'm going to go ahead and set my elevation zones. I'm going to clear what's there. I'm going to auto fill in starting at value 80 and going up to 400. And I want to take these in 10 meter increments. And I'm going to have it auto set the colors as well. Okay. Draw side faces. So everything projects down essentially to a flat plane on the edges. Reverse the face order. What I see is the front to the back. Uh, grid extrapolation, place display order, background. Uh, really nothing else I need to do here. Maybe I have an inclusion, exclusion perimeter. So maybe I want to tell it even though I have this full size grid, I only want part of this thing drawn. I'm not worried about any of it. So I'll hit OK. And then I'll give it a few seconds and let it draw the grid. Now, if you've ever had a class, if, if you've ever been in a class that I've taught, you've heard this probably more times than you, you care to have heard. But I apply the, the old rule here of, number one, give it time. Let the program work. Let it do what it needs to do. Don't go check your mail. Don't go you know, start a game of solitaire. Let it do what it needs to do to process. But at the same time, apply the five-minute rule to it. If it does not happen in five minutes for most processes, it is not going to happen. So don't sit around and wait nine hours and you know then decide to call tech support and say, hey, why did it take nine hours? If five minutes go by and nothing has changed, there's no uh, 
indicator at the bottom saying that it's on 3% or 5% or 15%, stop it. Stop the process and say, all right, what could possibly be going on here? Is there a glitch in the data? Do I need to reduce it more? So give it the time to work, but you use a little bit of, you know, of, uh, I guess, thought with it. Don't let it go beyond that, uh, uh, that five-minute mark. Okay, it's prompting me to put the legend in and the legend size, and then it takes me back into the grid file utilities. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of the grid file utilities because I want to look at what I've gotten from my grid. Okay, so based on the information I gave it, if I were to do a 3D viewer, and I'm just going to pick a chunk of this, I'm not going to try to take the the whole thing on the first go through. There's what my DEM is looking like uh, based on that grid. Now, like I said earlier, because this is it's a Carlson GRD file, the same things we've been working with for, uh, for years now. It's no different. Because it's a GRD file, I can do things with it. I can get volumes if I'm comparing it to another surface. If I went out and surveyed a piece of property right here in the middle, I could merge that. We talked about this earlier with the watershed analysis. I could take this into the hydrology packages and use this as my model uh, to, to do these things with. I want to look at a simple one. I want to go into the profile menu, and I want to do a quick profile. I want to get it from a surface file. I'll pick my surface file, which is my Austin W grid. And I'm just going to pick a couple of random points. And then we'll give it a second or two to analyze and process the data and do what it needs to do. And then there is my quick profile. I can save that to a PRO file, use it to draw road profiles later. I can draw it on the screen. I can print it. I can do whatever I want with this thing at this point. Okay. Essentially, what I've done is I've created a surface. Now, if I wanted to, using that 3D grid data, I could go in and create that TIN file. I could create a triangulated irregular network using surface model triangulating contour. Okay. But I have all of those same functions uh, that I would have using the grid. It's just a Carlson grid file. So we imported the DEM converted it to the GRD or the grid file, and now we can use it to do other functions. Volumes by grid surface, so I can do one surface, two surface volumes. If I told it to draw a surface, there's my uh, draw 3D grid file again. Contour from a triangular mesh or a grid file. I'm going to do it from a grid file. It's prompting me for an inclusion or exclusion parameter because that was something I had set the last time I used that. I'll pick my grid file. Contour layer. My contour interval, I don't want this at 1 meter contours. I'm going to go at 10 meter. I'm going to tell it to draw index and intermediate contours. I'm going to use the default. I'm not going to go ahead and put labels on it. I'll just leave them as just the contours. I really just want to show that you know it's, it's there. So we'll use the settings as is. We'll hit OK and we'll let it go. Now, I did the grid resolution. I changed the resolution on this one, uh, reducing the amount of data that's here. Um, that's something to, to really consider. I played with a couple of these DEM files. Uh, recently that we're in feet, uh, we were looking at 30 feet by 30 feet. Uh, maybe it wasn't that shallow. Maybe it was a couple hundred feet by a couple hundred feet. But we were dealing with a ridiculous amount of data. Just to draw the grid file on the screen was taking 20 to 30 minutes uh, to, to get it to draw and pop, 
to, to draw in completely. Now that 30 minutes is past the five minute rule, but it goes back to the other point of it. At the bottom, it was showing a, a status or a progress. I could see that something was happening, so I was okay with, with waiting for that. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to freeze the grid layer so that all I see are my contours. Okay, so pretty easily we've taken a DEM file that we downloaded for free. We didn't, I didn't pay for that. It's not stolen property. It's public domain. It's out there for the taking. We downloaded the DEM file from USGS. We imported it, converted it to a grid. We've drawn it as contours. We've drawn it as a profile. Uh, and, and now we have data we could analyze. We can do slope analysis. We can do water analysis. Uh, we can actually do quite a bit of stuff with this information at this point. What I'd like to do now is just check with Dave and see what kind of questions have come up so far on what we've done. Anything? Excellent job so far, Paul. Uh, no questions at this point. Uh, in fact, I had been writing some of my own questions down here, but you're answering those as you go along. Um, I, the question I had was, are these uh, DEM files available for free? And you've answered that. That's great. This, I can see this would be a terrific application for getting some off-site off watersheds rather than digitizing contours off of a uh, USGS map or, or whatever tool you're using to get those off-site areas rather than going out and spending the money to survey that. This gives you a good you know, 20,000 foot level uh, view of that off-site watershed area that you need to do a feasibility study or, or what have you. Um, the other question I had for you, Paul, is um, these grid file sizes uh, look like it was a 9 megabyte file, is that correct? Roughly, but, but is there a range? Uh, how, how large are these DEM files when you download them and then when you convert them into a grid file? What, what size files are we talking about, it's just in a range? If we go in and look, the file I downloaded, the Austin West DEM, was close to 10 megs, 9.6 megs. So we're looking at close to 10 megs for that. I have another one in here just to show an example. Uh, this is a different format DEM. This is a larger area. We're looking at 22 megs. I had another one that was 26 megabytes. So the DEM file sizes can range uh, anywhere from a couple of megs. Uh, for example, here's another one that's 4 megs. So these things can range from a few meg megabytes to pretty massive files. The GRD file, for example, this one, after having been reduced, we're about the same size as the DEM file that was imported. So we're about that uh, 9 megabit or 8.7 meg uh, uh, file. The zip formats, you can see here, not even a meg. Okay, So they're, they're going to range. You have to remember there's a lot of information here. If you go to the USGS website or just do a search on how the data is collected, how they lay out the profiles along the uh, origins of, of uh, latitude, longitude, and how they profile and collect this information. And you see the actual amount of information that's in there. It's actually pretty impressive. We do have some questions that have trickled in now, Paul. Um, first off, what's the difference between, can you explain the difference between a grid file and a tin file? The, in, in Carlson terms, when we're talking about a TIN, we're talking about a triangulation file. We're talking about um, if we were to create a triangulation, let me see if I can find just a small area, or actually we can do it using our grid. So let's go in and the let's The basic difference, uh, three points versus four three points, points on the interpolation. Three points versus four uh, is, is a basic difference to look at it simplistically. Um, to, to me, because you're dealing with four points, I like a tin better than a grid. Uh, I don't want to say it's more accurate, uh, because I don't know that accuracy is the, the right term there. I think it's a better representation of the data, uh, as opposed to more accurate or more precise. It's just a better representation. And that's a method that's been used for generating contours for, uh, for, for quite a while. But that, that's in simplistic terms. That's probably okay. the... Uh, how, what's the best site uh, for...
containing these DEM files. That was USGS.org? The, the USGS.gov. Uh, gov. Uh, there are other places that you can get DEM files. And again, if I go back to that very first part of the conversation, um, there are different types of these files. Uh, a DEM is a DEM is a DEM, but not really. Uh, if you look on uh, who had the document about it, I think um, it may have been Wikipedia had a document about DEM source files. The extensions for these things are just like ASCII files. If, if you say, I got an ASCII file from so-and-so, that ASCII file could have come from any program. It could have come from a, a Carlson data collector. It could have come from a, a Leica controller. It could have come from a Trimble controller. It could have come from Civil 3D. It could have come from Terramod. It could have come from anywhere. And the extension on that thing could be anything. It could be PTS, XYZ, TXT, ASC, Bob, Fred, Varney, Wilma, doesn't matter. I could call it almost anything. What matters is that the data, what is the data inside? So if you do a Google search and say, you know, where can I download DEM files, you're probably going to be overwhelmed with the amount of information that's out there. And you're, it's easy to get confused or to get lost in it because there are all these other file formats. But when we're talking about what I'm looking at here, these DEM digital elevation models from the USGS, again, if you go to USGS.gov, do a search for DEM files, okay? Or if you want to write down the web page here, this is exactly where I'm getting it, uh, HTTP colon backslash backslash edc2.usgs.gov slash geodata slash index. This is where I came to get the uh, DEM file that I used. I went to the alphabetical list. And also you'll get the document on the DEM standards so you can get more information about the, uh, the DEM. Uh, but there's my alphabetical list. If I wanted to look for uh, Davenport, Iowa, East and West, Dallas, Texas, East and West, all kinds of different uh, geoids that are up here. Again, as part of USGS, those are no charge, no fee. That's up there for me to, to get. Okay, what about if we're in Canada, Paul? Where do we go? Have you uh, searched for anything in Canada? There is a DEM um, model for Canada, and off the top of my head, I'm not remembering where I saw that. Uh, if you, again, if you Google DEM, uh, I, I think the Wikipedia document talked about DEM files for other parts of the world, including Canada. Um, You'll find more documentation on that. There's, there's all kinds of uh, information out there. And Canada was mentioned. I honestly, uh, j just to be honest about it, didn't spend too much time focusing on uh, our Canadian neighbors to the north there, nor did I go south of the border. I, I, I really focused my search here on the USGS. And I guess shame on me for doing that. But th there is information that explains where to get that. Uh, I've got a question here um, about doing this process in Civil 3D versus Carlson, is it a similar process of, access of uh, importing the DEM files and creating grids? D different process um, because most things are going to be different inside of Civil 3D as opposed to Carlson. Even though if we're talking about a road, for example, we're talking about alignments, profiles, sections, and templates, uh, we're talking about the same things, but how you go about it is different. If you look, for example, on the, uh, the blog posting, that references the national elevation data set, the NED files, that was actually imported into the uh, uh, map explorer inside of Civil 3D. So that was brought in through, uh, through that method. But it would be handled there. There's some similarities in that you're importing data and converting it to something that that program recognizes. But that's about where the similarities stop. They're, they're handled a little differently at that point. Okay, we, we got a, uh, some feedback from one of our uh, EMEA guys uh, from Europe, Middle East, Asia, part of our, our team out there. Uh, it says, hi guys, for our European visitors, might be good to mention EEA.Europe.EU. Uh, you can find DEM models there. There we go. Okay. 
Um, question about how many points were in that file. Uh, do you recall how many points were in that uh, ASCII file? Mm -hmm. If I go back and look at my grid info, no grid loaded. I need to load it. Garbage in, garbage out. So I'll pick my uh, grid file. Okay. There's the information, the grid corners, the grid resolution, grid cell size. And let's see if it's under the grid info. Uh, there we go, number of samples. So if I'm reading this report right, uh, there should be over uh, a, million. Uh, a million corners, grid corners inside this file. Now this isn't the original DEM. Remember, this is the GRD file. So I'm looking at the file that has been created from the DEM, and I've changed the resolution on this. I've reduced the number of squares. So I probably reduced it um, by half, maybe. So that would make me believe that we're looking double that. Okay. Um, and how does reducing the resolution uh, affect the contours? Well, you're reducing the amount of data that's in there. So if the original resolution is a 50 by 50 foot square, uh, I'm drawing the contours between those 50 by 50 foot lines. If I reduce that to 200 by 200, I'm essentially throwing out a lot of that in-between data. Okay, so I'm reducing the, again, I want to watch my terminology here between accuracy and precision, but I'm reducing the amount of information that's there uh, for the contours to be pulled from. Because of that, the more I reduce this file, the more error I'm going to introduce into those contours, or uh, the more accuracy I will be, be taking from them. So you don't want to come into one of these files and reduce it to a 500 by 500 foot you know, grid square because your contours are going to be uh, pretty horrible. Uh, and, and then again, if you go back and look at the information from USGS about their level of accuracy, they, they explain the different methods. The 7.5 minute uh, would be the more accurate. Uh, based on the level one method they use of collecting it, which includes the uh, planimetric information, so on and so forth. But the, uh, the more accurate the original file is, the better my grid file is going to be, and the less I tamper with that, the better my contours profile, so on and so forth, are going to be. And then to go back to what I said originally, too, I'm not replacing survey data with this. This is a supplement. This is an addition. If I'm looking for accurate one-foot contours or even two-foot contours, I don't know that this is a good supplement. I may want to go out and have it flown uh, you know, using LIDAR, for example, or laser scanning, or even surveyed to get that level of, of accuracy. But to go with uh, like what we were talking about before with a watershed analysis, uh, it's probably accurate enough to do a decent watershed analysis. Uh, the the DEMs listed on the USGS website, Paul, are those quadrangles? They are the equivalent. If we go back to the presentation that was here, let me pull this back up. The seven and a half minute DEM files, which are 30 by 30 meter square grids, are the equivalent. They're 10 or 30 meter grid spacing and provide coverage in a 7 by 7 minute block. Each product serves the same coverage as a standard USGS 7.5 minute quadrangle. Okay. Great. So that's, that's what USGS is saying. Okay. And here's a question. How do I locate my site on a DEM file? Print it out and throw a dart? <laughs> no, I, I would say probably you know, when I look at this DEM file, um, let me turn on my mesh again here. If I'm looking at this, it goes back to the old argument I've had with people for years about triangulation models. They'll draw a set of triangles on the screen and say, I can tell you everything about that site by looking at the triangles. Well, I'm looking at a series of grids, and I can't tell you anything about this site. All I see are squares. But when I add the contours to this, 
and I start to see some definition and shape, I start to recognize, okay, what I'm looking at here, this is Lake Travis in Austin, Texas. This is the Colorado River. Okay, I can start to identify features and say, all right, if I'm looking at this, there's a highway that comes through here. I know where that is. Here it is. So from a rough standpoint, there's how I find it. Because all of this data is digitally um, uh, rectified or is on true state plane values, if I brought this in on a NAT83 Texas Central plane, I could match my coordinates. If I look at the coordinates in the lower left-hand corner, I could match my coordinates with the uh, survey location of the drawing. Maybe I put a survey point in there. But that data is georeferenced, and I, I should easily be able to, to identify that. Great. Um, another question here. Uh, when when was this available in Carlson to uh, to do this? Can we do this in earlier versions of uh, Carlson software, Paul? 2010 was the first time I've seen it. I, I can't speak for older versions. Um, in the past, if a client asked about how do we deal with DEM files, we always referred them to AutoCAD Map to handle the DEM data um, because I was unaware of a, of a way to do it inside of Carlson. If it has been here, I would say 08 or 09 may have been the earliest one, but I never recall seeing that option prior to 2010. Uh, we could go back and find, I'm sure Dave can contact one of the programmers or, or get the specifics on it, but I personally haven't seen it prior to 2010. Great. That's uh, it for questions right now. Paul, do you have more or, or do you want to stay online for some more questions? I am happy to, add, uh, to stay and answer any questions. Um, one of the things I'll bring out, uh, just because we, we've kind of gone on through that, is uh, just to mention, I get questions about this fairly regularly. Uh, when is 2011 coming? When are we going to see it? September 15th is the official date for the release of the 2011 product. Now, this is important because AutoCAD 2011 has been released. A lot of companies are starting to upgrade. You have to have the Carlson 2011 version to run on your AutoCAD 2011 software. Okay. If you're not sure if you're going to do it, uh, that's the big reason to. Aside from everything that's been added, uh, and Dave and I were just going over the list of, uh, of highlights for, for 2011. And I caught a couple that caught my eye. Vehicle path tracking was a was a pretty nice one. And, and there are some other things. I will assume closer to release, this will be published. Yes. Uh, and, and we'll probably even have it on our site. So you can go look and see other reasons to look at 2011. Uh, my big thing is that AutoCAD 2011, even though there are great functions in here and great things have been added, um, if I'm considering or if I've made that jump to AutoCAD 2011, I, I really can't wait for this thing to come out. Okay. So I'm happy. We, we've wrapped up about 12 or 15 minutes early here. So I'm happy to stay and answer as many questions as I can about other topics for anybody that wants to stay and ask them. Anybody that uh, uh, is done and is ready to go to lunch, then I say go to lunch, have a great day, have a great weekend, and uh, thanks for coming. I hope you learned something, got something out of it, and then I'll stay and answer other questions about other topics. I think we're good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you again. Two weeks in a row. We sure appreciate your help with these webinars. Very educational today. Uh, I learned quite a bit. Uh, next week, uh, we should have another webinar. I believe Jennifer's online next week again. And sorry, I didn't check that out earlier, but... Uh, her, her webinars have been very valuable and, and appreciated by uh, a lot of our users out there. So we look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you again, Paul. If you have questions, please contact uh, Paul or myself. Paul is available at info at carlsonds.com. Thank you.